everyone. Um, <laughs> get a response. So, I'm Nishan, and I'm here to talk about gardens. When we say gardens, what do you think about? Do you think of Shalimar Mughal Gardens, uh, uh, the Persian culture of gardens in India and abroad? Do you think of biblical or mythological gardens, uh, as in Garden of Eden? Do you think of French gardens, as in Versailles? Or do you think of Central Park, New York, for example? For me, the gardens are spaces where one can try to interact with nature, maybe tame it, and maybe let it take over. These are the pious places where you can see wondrous life cycle happening at a very fast pace. Well, in the light of eternity. These are also the spaces where not only we interact with nature, but we also understand the cosmos in general, where it, where it kind of takes us over, takes over us and, and lets let us feel the cosmos uh, and the environment. The, just to validate my uh, self reliability and also my mental well being, I'm not the only person who is so crazy in love with gardens. Gardens has been a very intensive part of architecture and design since native civilizations. I'm talking about BCE already. And people have created these gardens uh, as microcosm of ideas, manifesting them and making them alive. These are metaphysical ideas which they try to put in an effort to put heaven on earth. And for example, Utkwan. Utkwan is a word, a Sanskrit word, where it means a small part of it and one is a forest. So that is essentially a space where you can roam around without having the fear of being killed by uh, a wild animal per se. And even in Indian culture, let's say Ramayana, we are men we mention Ashok Vatika. I, I know I can't make, even imagine the turmoil of Sita after being abducted by Ravan, but Ashok Vatika was perhaps the best place to get pacified uh, in the otherwise urban golden Lanka. So we are talking about these spaces here, and then allow me to take you to Bundelkhand, which where our case study is like. Now, Bundelkhand is an agroecological zone, a kind of a cultural region, lying halfway north in Uttar Pradesh and halfway south in Madhya Pradesh. And it has similar language, similar music, and similar kind of traditions and history as well. If you, if, if you think about Bundelkhand, you think about Chhansi Girani and also Mastani now. So these are the iconic figures from Bundelkhand. There is a small town in Rajnagar, that's, that's where we'll be focusing on. This town is three kilometers north of Khajuraho, which is a very famous world heritage site. And a small historic town in its nature, where Basically, people live in harmony. You have nice, small streets, old houses, and people uh, interact with one another. They celebrate festivals. It also has water source as one of the bigger lakes, which was a man-made lake. So Bundelkhand, in principle, do not have great rivers. What they do is they make funds, they collect rainwater, and they use it for agriculture. And agriculture is the primary source of income in the region. This is also, just to remind that this is right next to this iconic world heritage site of Khajuraho. So when we say gardens, we are not talking about one or two gardens. There were 15 such royal gardens. There were 15 such royal gardens, uh, which, were all, which were spread all across the city, which had a radius of three kilometers. So we are talking about an urban historical phenomena, which happened in the 18th century where people went crazy with the fashion. It's like having a drawing room. Now you have drawing room people, everybody has a drawing room. Earlier this was not the tradition. Similar was the 18th century tradition of having gardens in your name. And these are the kind of gardens I'm talking about. These are produced gardens with beautiful old mango trees, agroforestry, abundance of nature, and a little bit of culture thrown into it. So these gardens, because these are produced gardens, uh, and because of the agriculture, uh, it allows uh, the continuity of the landscape. So when you see agriculture, this is what it continues. So you can't even make out here, where is the garden and where is the boundary of that garden because it continues the landscape. <laughs> if we try to date it within the world garden chronology, this is basically, we are dating it in the Mughal uh, India tradition of garden, making where the Vedic India tradition comes in 
and uh, from forever times. We uh, we don't even know how long far it dates back. And then it basically culminates into this beautiful tradition with Mughal and Hindu uh, uh, garden designing. Normally, a garden, a Bundeli garden, would be of this sort. So uh, this would be, if you can see, there's a koti uh, in between. There is a Shiva temple, Shiva temple dedicated to Lord Shiva, and then there is a bauli, which is a step well, and then there is a draw well through which you take water and you irrigate the fields, and a samadhi or cenotaph, uh, which is a memorial of, uh, in the name of the king or the queen or the nobility who has basically owned the garden. They look like something like this. So when we first went to Bundesland, people or everybody thought that these were fields. These were ordinary fields with boundary around them. And nobody considered them as gardens because in our head, garden has a very strict geometry and in, also, you know, in its, its own meaning of leisure. Bundesland being a drought prone area, garden means much more. Garden means where you can grow food. If you have water, you have bounty, you have power. So this is how they interpreted a small modest region interpreted their own system of agriculture and garden landscaping. You can see kotis here, you can see Shiva temples, you can see small plants growing, you can have different kind of typology of architecture more or less in the same style or language. And this is something where you can go in, you can pitch your tent, you can have bounty of food in an otherwise drought prone region and have a great time. Do your daily rituals through the step wells, sometimes as magnificent as this, and sometimes more modest like this. Have summer roots inside it to protect you from the heat of the area, which as, as much as goes like 45 degrees, which is a very normal thing. Right from March, it gets very, very hot in the region, and it does not get better with the climate change. Drought is a recurrent phenomena, and in this heat, it's really a solace to have such kind of spaces and micro ecosystems. <laughs> It continues the elaborate step well traditions also they, they keep on changing their shapes and size and forms and manifesting their ideas of metaphysical and conserving the water into different things. And all the gardens would have this koti and a shiva temple right next to it. So this is a very recurrent typology which is continued everywhere. We not only found these gardens only in Rajnagar but also all these red dots which spreads all across Bundelkhand. So these are basically, and the yellow dots, but the one where we found them in archives, or we read history, we went through the books, and we basically found them that the, there is a, all traces and content of gardens of our history in this region. So if we look at it, if we connect the dots, this was basically an, a historical cultural route from a kingdom to kingdom, where you would use garden as a pitching tent uh, space and you would stop there, take rest, or have diplomatic meetings. That's where you would interact. A king would come outside the city, the another king would come outside the city, they would pitch a tent together in a garden and talk about diplomacy. So that's how this project of Lost Garden of Khajrao comes into being. I have to mention here, I'm just one person representing a whole group of people who have worked very hard on this project for a long, long time. And this Lost Garden of Khajrao project came into being in 2004. Now, it's a very interesting concept. People, now you will hear a lot about community participation, community involvement. But to really involve a community into a project is a tremendous act of patience. So if, you, if you're ready for the patience, this is definitely an area for you. So we started involving owners. Two of the owners, of, because these gardens are privately owned, two owners, Mr. Pateria and Mr. Nayak, agreed to sign a memorandum of agreement with us so that they will work with us together in the conservation of these royal gardens. So we took this approach where uh, we used the four pillars, economy, culture, social, and environment as, as, as the change comes and as the development happens and cultural heritage becomes an impetus or an accelerator in the development of it. So going forward, then the organic farming, the most important part of the project was organic farming. So we started immediately organic farming and in the, in the gardens, because these were produced gardens. When I say produced gardens, they mean agricultural gardens. We would grow food here. And we quickly joined hands with Navdanya, which is an organic farming movement. And now we are working with Gandhi Smarak Nidhi of Madhya Pradesh. And we continue to work with such local collaborators who have deep knowledge of traditional farming techniques in the area. 
And when I talk about it, then we immediately establish a seed bank. So now seed bank is a very unique concept where you basically put in your seed, you put it in a bank, and you can loan some seeds from it. Why would you loan seeds? Why can't you just take seeds? Now that is a very interesting story. In, in India, 58% of the population is dependent on agriculture as the source of livelihood, which is basically 9% of the world population. That's a lot of people. And then again, in last year, last financial year in 2018, it was the contribution of agriculture sector to the GDP of the country was 18%, which was around 271 US dollar, billion US dollars, or 18.3 trillion rupees, if you can at all count it. So that's a huge sector we are talking about, and a lot of people we are affecting with this project. Agriculture is, real, is a real deal. We have to address it. We as urbanized people often continue to ignore the importance of this sector in our lives because we get food from supermarket. But when you interact with food, it's a whole another ball game altogether. Sometimes you won't even like to eat the food which you, uh, if you see the process it goes through when you get it from supermarket. So organic is not elite, organic is need. So we established the seed bank quickly with the help of Mr. Pateria here. It was a very modest effort and we continue to build on it. And then we also address the, the idea of holy cow. So holy cow, cow is holy not because of just religious reasons, but in organic agriculture, we use manure, we use the calves for tilling, we use uh, uh, all sorts of products from the cows in the enriching of the soil itself. So cow is a very beneficial uh, animal for organic agriculture or traditional farming techniques as well. We quickly started training people, training more and more people in the organic farming techniques that nearby Mm, farmers and nearby people, or also youngsters who were not ready to take up farming as an occupation. And then we also came, came down to conserving the gastronomy of the region. Now, gastronomy is a very interesting term. Gastronomy basically means local, the food, food style, the, the art of food making. So local gastronomy can be humble, can be very elaborate as well. And here, what happens is, when you look at food in itself as an entity which exists, it's it's, imagine what kind of invention it must have gone through to come up with something like Bagan Ka Bharta, for example. Like the kind of thought process which has gone into it is incredible. It's incredible amount of time given to it and it's incredible, uh, it's incredible phenomena in itself. And then uh, that's why we talk about gastronomy here because when we talk about agriculture, agriculture leads to harvest. Harvest, a good harvest leads to bounty. Bounty leads to happiness, happiness needs to, leads to festivals, festivals leads to rituals, and this is how our culture is manifesting around us. We celebrate a lot of festivals across the whole year because of agriculture. So if you start relating to it, there is a very direct connection with the food system on how we are having our vacations. So we are really tangibly connected to it. We are also, in the part of the project, going to train local people in gastronomy techniques. The other part what we focus on is children. Children are uh, our future. Children are the one who will take up this strong responsibility of driving our world into a more sustainable and ecological, eco-friendly uh, world. And hopefully try to push back the climate change impacts as well. And here we try to train or teach the children as well in organic farming techniques and also tell them about their own Bundeli culture. Because you'll be surprised, but many of the kids are not exposed to their own rituals and cultures. Many of the kids don't go back to sc from school to question their how exactly they have been, they have, why do they celebrate these festivals? Why do we use this kind of crop in a particular festival? Why do we use Kile in Diwali? for example. So there, there is multiple things which, uh, which are missing and the link is getting wider and wider because we are getting more urbanized in the way we are getting away from our roots. So this is a one-way attempt to actually put back the kids into the way they think. And it's very interesting because we conducted a workshop with the kids uh, and high school students and we asked them to represent Bundeli culture and we gave them clay. Six out of the seven figures which they made was primarily agriculture-born. 
So they were, they made carts, they made bulls, they made harvest, they also made things to clean the harvest as well. So you can, you can understand and identify that how future, the kids can recognize their own culture. If perhaps in an urban environment a clay is given to a kid, you will probably build a skyscrapers or let's say a flyover or something. So this is how we perceive the world around us. And this is very reflective in the way we, we respond to it as well. Of course, with the project ongoing, we are able to support a livelihood and economy. There are many families which are being supported with the project. And we try to involve them. We try to have an organic farming outlet also. That is the next thing we are working on, that we are able to monetize their farming techniques. Unless you don't give employment to people, there is very little impetus. And that is one of the things we are, uh, as a country, should be focusing on. The other part, which is the most important part for me personally as a conservation architect, is the cultural heritage. We tried to, how did we take, so now why am I talking here? We are talking because I want to share this small little idea where we thought that we don't have to take care of anybody's cultural heritage. People themselves can take care of it. Cultural heritage does not become a liability for everyone. It is not something where we drain the public money into, but it is something where people own it, maintain it, and try to preserve it for the times to come. With under certain regular regulations and guidelines, we were able to re-establish the Shiva, tem uh, Shiva statue, uh, Shivlingam basically, in this uh, Shiva temple of Rani Bag, for example. And now Rani Bag gets regular visitors, they maintain their space, and we don't have to do anything about it. We as an organization trying to conserve it, we are out of the system and people do it themselves. So it's a people-run conservation project now. Similarly, uh, on the same lines, we are also trying to host as much as possible because these gardens were also the place where you would have uh, music festivals, you would have theaters, you would also have kushti. So we try to patronize the local musicians and uh, the musicians come and perform in local traditional Bundeli uh, music. It's a beautiful site, it's a beautiful garden, and if we get, if you ever get a chance, please do visit us, and we can perform, uh, we can organize a rehearsal, uh, a music uh, festival for you there. Similarly, for built heritage, we are using local traditional techniques. Now, what are local traditional techniques? Lime, lime is what we use. What happens with lime when you use lime? Lime is strengthens over time. Cement becomes weaker over time. It's, it's a scientific fact that the life of cement is 70 years. So it, it degrades over time. And while lime gets stronger and stronger, it's definitely more difficult to make in the first place. So that's why we try to avoid it, and we go for the shortcut. So if we don't take a shortcut, we have a better building and a more sustainable architecture for future generations. So this is one of the koti which we conserved in, in, um, in, in a, as part of the project. And uh, the other challenges which we face other than built heritage is the drought. Now drought, we all know that climate is changing. We have drought as a recurring phenomena. In 2016, we had such a bad drought in Bunelkan that the three-year-old mango tree died, which is quite it's, it's, it's a reasonable age, a tree can normally survive after three years. But the water table went so much down that the mango tree don't completely die. When the tree die, then how do you save the harvest? When the harvest dies, how do you save the local economy? So that, to address that and to counter that, we went back to the traditional system, and now we are trying to make check dams and buns as the Chandela kings in 9th century used to make. Because as the folklore goes in Bundelkhan, if you make a check dam and a pond, you are immortal. People get immortalized by conserving water there because this is the elixir of life we are talking about. So we started looking into this and we are pushing public authorities to take up certain steps to start having buns and check dams in the area to increase the water table, to conserve the rainwater uh, when it rains and then we save it for the future use and the annual uh, agricultural needs as well. But another challenge is that we are trying to uh, address is because as we, the, the title of our project is Lost Gardens of Khajrao, they are getting lost. Because if I, if I ask you this question, which everybody asks each other is, Arden Pardon went to the garden, Arden died, who was left? Definitely not the garden, because the gardens are getting lost. 
because garden is the first la entity which suffers urbanization. This example in 2010, which was Khan Kabag, looks something like this now. So we are losing them in time and time. So we are trying to interact with more owners of the garden that they sign agreement with us so that we can do together a project of conservation of these beautiful heritage entities, which actually defines Bundeli identity. So a lot of contemplation and a lot of discussions with the stakeholders, we came to certain two big projects, which was the manifestation of those ideas which we were always running apart from the agriculture. One was we had to design a cow shed. Now, as an architecture uh, student and an architecture graduate later, I never thought that I'll be designing a cow shed in my life, to be very honest. So, but then it came to that, and we had to understand the needs of the cow. What we did, however, was that instead of doing it ourselves, we released the drawing in Hindi, which is the local understandable language, and we gave it to the people. So we said, there you go, the drawing is there, can you do it yourself? And they started doing a beautiful job of it. We defined the materials, we did basic archaeology to understand where is the best place for the cow shed, which was earlier, earlier a horse shed before. So they started building on those old foundations and using only mud as a binding material and brick and stone. And then they used the bamboo from the whole garden area. On the corners, you have bamboo groves. So instead, they started cutting it, curing it, and also using it in this process. Now, the question was roofing. Do, do you realize when you go around in the area, you always see these shiny uh, steel roofing, which shine back in the heat, or these ugly black tarpaulins, which actually cover a lot of slum areas. But these people, we requested them to go for something alternative. And then they invited the local potter. And the potter just took the mud out in one of the part of our field and started making these roof tiles. They baked it on the site. And now we have something, a very happy cow, more or less, beautiful structure, which actually complements not only to the architecture of the area, but also the colors. So if you look at the colors, these are muted colors, which actually b goes beautiful um, blends beautifully with the environment around. The other bigger project was a training center or a visitor center for the Lost Garden of Khajrao project. Because we wanted to talk about this project. We wanted to have a seed bank, a permanent one. We wanted a place where we could train people in local gastronomy. And above all, we wanted a place where farmers could come together to talk the issues of organic farming and traditional farming techniques. So normally, a garden would always have this kind of koti and a temple. But the site which we got as architects was this one, where there was a temple, but there was no koti. Now the challenge was that we had to bring in another element or another building there. We had to respect the context. We had to respect the history and the tradition of the architecture. And we responded something with this. We, we respected the lines of the temple. The, it was a basic structure which looked more or less like the Koti. The tower was high enough and uh, to shade. It was in the south, so it would shade the roof and uh, is protected from the heat as well. But what we also did was we used very traditional materials. We used our own bulls to churn the lime and made lime mortar in traditional techniques. And we used this as the mortar, as the binding element of the architecture itself. For the steps, we thought, because the garden did not have a step well, and we want the visitors to experience a step well. So we made the staircase, which is going to the roof as a step well, and the tower was just open to sky. So we would have beautiful light pouring in, and a void around the steps, which actually protected it from heat, and so-called passive cooling systems. So now the garden, the visitor center is standing something like this, and we are still progressing. We are still doing the works, and we hope to cover it by next February. And the inside of the view is beautiful. So when you go into the hall, you see this beautiful bauli, which actually leads you to upstairs instead of going downstairs to the water. You connect with the elements of the nature, and you have a space to discuss, to, to think about it, to ponder about issues, and actually address those social concerns and issues for local farmers. We are not designing primarily for tourists who would come to Khajrao or something. It is also for them, but it is for the local tourism themselves. So there is something called local tourism as well which happens, and we should address it. The Bauli looks like this, and we have these beautiful steps. 
uh, we have used the same proportions as in a Bundeli Bauli. So it more or less looks like we have recreated a Bauli there. And see, recently we invited some students over and they were really excited about the whole design. They explored the whole building, they explored the materials, they, they enjoyed the coolness of the building as compared to the very hot outside. And it was a very interesting phenomena to interacting with them, answering their questions about the design and henceforth. For the jharokha, which is actually an element, an aesthetic element on top, what we have not only thought about that how we are going to put it structurally above, because earlier the walls were very thick, two feet thick. Do you understand two feet? Two feet is more or less um, this much. These, this used to be the thickness of the wall. But now that we are talking about, we had very thin walls, but it's a load-bearing system. So we designed a jharokha which can have its own weight, or the truss system. We use, we call it a truss system. So it's a network of trusses of Corton steel, which is the weathered brown steel. So it does not shine in the environment or does not create a deflection or from the aesthetic. And we will have something in the form of a jharoka there as a beautiful aesthetic element and something aspirational for the villagers themselves and the town people themselves, because we have to understand people have aspirations. We need to make them understand that with their own traditional architecture, they can come up with something very, very pretty. And they need to reinterpret it, re rethink about it and uh, address it. So something now, uh, this is one of the last slide, and I would like to show you that the center stands very beautifully next to the mango tree. And we want to start having organic farming techniques uh, training and biodiversity conservation research uh, in it and seed f uh, seed bank as well along with the local gastronomy incubating in the being incubated in the center and lastly we are very happy to announce that we have changed the name of the project from lost garden of khajrao to royal gardens of rajnagar because the people are so happy about it that they really want to embrace the idea when we started the project, the gardens were getting lost, but now people want to embrace their own heritage, and we think we should we respond to it. We create a positive note of ha calling them a Royal Gardens of Rajnagar, which is also supported by MP Tourism now, and we are quite ecstatic about it. Thank you. Thank you.